Well, welcome back. In this second part um, of our time together talking about moral injury, um, I'm going to shift our attention uh, to these issues of identification and intervention. Uh, when I say identification, um, I'm really thinking about kind of some measurement issues here. So I'll show you different measures and then um, uh, findings related to those measures and, and other ways that uh, moral injury has been thought about, as well as uh, delving into some of uh, what we've seen among healthcare workers uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and then with the last part of our time together, we'll get into uh, some intervention stuff. So again, I hope to have uh, some time for Q&A in here. We'll actually uh, pause um, midway a little bit um, to have some, some Q&A. Uh, and then again, as I noted uh, earlier, we'll, we'll um, near the end uh, invite folks to do uh, a, another kind of guided mindfulness uh, exercise, trying to do some different things uh, as part of our, our webinar experience today. Okay, so I know we had this poll question up right before we went to the break. So it looks like a lot of you uh, are saying that you at least sometimes, if not frequently, encounter moral injury in your work. So about 80% of folks are endorsing that, which is intriguing to me because we, we had about 75% who's, who said either never heard of it or heard of it, but really don't know anything about, of it, uh, but about it. But now that we're talking about it a bit, the uh, vast majority of you saying, oh yeah, this is something I encounter in my work. So I, I have this image of uh, the elephant again, right before we went to break, I was kind of using that metaphor a little bit of each of us having a different angle on the elephant and something that we're, we're looking at. As I talk about identification and as I talk about measurement, uh, I wanna kind of keep that metaphor in mind and, and here on this image, you know, I've just got the trunk highlighted. So um, I've participated in a lot of measurement of moral injury and in the development of measures for moral injury and in the adaptation of measures for moral injury. Uh, so clearly this is something um, that I'm invested in, in different ways. And I want to say both to myself and to folks who are um, on this webinar today and listening to this, that's a piece of it. Uh, that's not the totality uh, of understanding um, moral injury and so I'd, hopefully we, we can kind of keep some of that in mind um, and in that spirit I actually want to begin before getting into some of the different measures and, and looking at that stuff asking this question you know should we be measuring moral injury uh, at all and I want to acknowledge that there are different pitfalls to measurement uh, many of these pitfalls apply yes to moral injury as well as to measuring lots of different um, psychological phenomena certainly uh, and probably measuring other uh, social sorts of phenomena that we often uh, measure in our society but you know one of the things with respect to moral injury um, is that you know measurement we we do potentially risk reducing somebody's experience to being either high or low on a measure one of the things I should point out is there is no cut point right now for moral injury. There is for major depressive disorder, for post-traumatic stress disorder, um, for you know anything that you're gonna find in the DSM, there are cut points, there are criteria for you either have disorder or you don't have the disorder. Moral injury is not like that. There is, there is no cut point uh, presently for you have it versus you don't. Uh, even so, we do have measures um, that can spit out a score. And you, you know, you have a score of 36 or 22 or 28. Well, how do how do we compare that? What does that mean? Uh, hopefully, we have not reduced somebody's experience to a score of a 36 or a 27. Um, hopefully, these measures are not downplaying the importance of somebody's narrative, right? Their story of their individual moral injury 
experience. And I think as care providers, when we listen to people, there's a way that we know this, you know, intuitively, of course, we're hearing somebody's story and holding that. The systems that we work in sometimes, though, um, when you start introducing numbers into them and metrics into them, there, there can start to be these larger pressures to reduce experiences to um, a number on a measure. And so I think that's something that we need to be careful about. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that moral injury may not be, and I don't think is, a fully measurable phenomenon. I think there are aspects of it that we can measure and that are helpful to measure. Uh, I think we, sh we should be measuring moral injury because it's helpful to identify it. You know, we might not know that somebody's wrestling with somebody unless we ask some of these questions, uh, depending on what the measure is. Uh, it's also helpful in, in terms of you know, kind of looking at, are, is somebody changing over time? Are they improving? Uh, it's helpful, I think, in some of the work that, uh, you know, I'll be sharing with you and knowing how prevalent is this? How common is this among a population? So there's all sorts of reasons to be measuring, and that's, that's why I'm, you know, engaged in this work. But there are many aspects of moral injury that I don't think are fully measurable and, and want to name that and acknowledge it and, and not think that we are uh, capturing the totality uh, of someone's ex experience when, when we're not necessarily. Uh, measurement can also invite kind of this disease treatment mentality or a symptom reduction mentality. Um, and that seems like, well, you know, maybe that's a good thing. We're helping people, right? Um, as we'll get into with some of these measures of moral injury, some of them are asking questions like, you know, did you witness something that you thought was wrong, right? Or did you participate in something that you thought was wrong? Well, if you strongly agree with that, and then you go through treatment, we're probably not going to change the fact that that thing happened, right? It happened. If the measure is looking at, did you experience a morally injurious event? That event occurred, and even after treatment, that event will still have occurred. So uh, it's, it's important to kind of look at what are we talking about uh, with respect to symptoms and also um, what, is, what is realistic and what is expectable um, and, and how you know, should we even experience our lives as human beings if we have gone through something that is morally injurious? Is there a part of that that maybe is a appropriate to carry with us, right? I, these these are, are challenging questions that are not easy to answer if the only frame we're using is a diagnosis and symptom kind of framework. Uh, some of these are more philosophical and existential kinds of questions that are brought up when we start talking about morality. So, by viewing this through the lens that, that we typically view things through within a healthcare context, I, I hope that we're resisting you know, this, this potential pitfall of diminishing serious consideration of all these other aspects, many of which I've, I've already alluded to, you know, including social, spiritual, theological, communal, political, ethical, like these many other aspects of moral injury that continue to be important to think about. Uh, and also, again, it's a little bit preaching to myself as, as a psychologist, but should we allow some of these different conceptualizations of moral injury to challenge uh, some of the boundaries of, of mental health paradigms? Uh, so as a psychologist, um, the you know, clinical work that psychologists are most likely to do is psychotherapy, right? Well, often that's individual. It's certainly within the clinic. Rarely are we kind of participating with other providers. Very rarely are we doing anything from a psychotherapeutic perspective that involves participating with communities, right? But moral injury is something that involves an, a, an experience of community for many individuals. It involves um, experiences that are very um, spiritual and religious in nature. Um, so from a mental health perspective, I, I hope that we can, we can take men, uh, moral injury seriously enough to go, Okay, psychotherapy has a role here. There are things that we can bring to the table, and maybe we need to be thinking about other things too. 
um, other, other, other ways uh, to address moral injury uh, collaboratively uh, with other healthcare professionals. Um, kind of to uh, put a, a, a period on this uh, thought or this, you know, conclude uh, my answer to this question, should we measure moral injury? There was um, an article uh, published a little over a couple decades ago now by uh, Letterberg and Fischette. Uh, those of you who are chaplains may recognize, you know, George Fischette's name there. He's a real pioneer. Uh, in the area of research in chaplaincy um, has been kind of leading that charge for a number of decades. Um, and as such, uh, so he, he's a chaplain and epidemiolo epidemiologist in, in, uh, at, at Rush University Medical Center. And as such, he's often uh, on the receiving end of these comments from chaplains of, you can't measure that. You know, at the spirituality or religious stuff or, or things related to faith, you, you can't measure those things. You know, what, what, are, what are you doing doing all this research stuff? Um, and so in this commentary, they, um, you know, we're, we're asking this question, can you measure a sunbeam with a ruler? You know, sort of bringing up this, can you really, can you really measure spirituality? And I think it's a great question. Hopefully you've been hearing me and what I've been saying, that measurement's not going to figure it all out. There are lots of things about spirituality and other experiences that are beyond what we are going to appreciate with a measure. And that's just how it is and how it's going to continue to be. And, and, and we need to realize that and live with it. Uh, I like this statement from their article, though, that says a ruler is a tool. It's not a blindfold. Uh, so just because this phenomenon is something that we can't fully understand with measurement, it's still useful to understand an aspect of it, right? So the tool can still be useful. We just, we need to understand it for what it is and, and approach these things humbly and not think, not blindfold ourselves with this tool and think that we've uh, understood the entirety uh, of a phenomenon. So uh, that may feel like a, a lengthy preamble to get into measurement of moral injury, but I, th I think this is a, particularly important area, especially because so much of this research has originated uh, out of the psychological literature, to be careful that as we're looking at moral injury, uh, we, we don't reduce the totality of this experience and everything that it can mean uh, to just, just scores on, on measures that we're using. Again, though, I do think there's utility here, as do clearly uh, a number of other individuals. So moral injury has only been around um, in, in, again, the scientific literature for about a decade. Uh, and we've got multiple different measures that have come out uh, during that time. These are listed roughly in order. I don't think perfectly so, but roughly in order uh, of when they were published. Um, and what you can see with this table here is uh, the measure name, the number of items on it, the response options. So most of these are some kind of uh, strongly agreed or strongly disagree. Um, and then uh, subscales uh, from, from the measure. Uh, so that first one that you see there, the moral injury event scale, uh, was published by Bill Nash and colleagues um, and is the most widely used measure of moral injury that's out there, largely in part because it was the first one that was published. Uh, when you're the first one that uh, publishes a thing, tends to be the one that gets picked up and is used. Um, what I'd invite you to notice on this measure is the two subscales. Um, and so I'll be showing you this measure again in a moment, but there's this subscale of perceived transgressions um, by you know yourself or others and perceived betrayals. So hopefully you're looking at that and you're going, oh yeah, that ties back to those two definitions. That definition from Jonathan Shea that was more betrayal based and that definition from Brett List that was, was more transgression based. So you're seeing it now reflected in our measures uh, of, of moral injury. Um, Joe Courier has come out with a couple of different measures of moral injury. So the uh, moral injury questionnaire military version and the expressions of moral injury scale uh, I'll show you the, this, this first one here. I'm not going to show you all these different measures, but I do want to give you a sense of some of the things that we're asking on uh, these kinds of measures. Uh, the reason for two uh, different measures um, that uh, Joe Courier and, and colleagues have, have come out with is uh, 
one of the things that the moral injury event scale and even this moral injury questionnaire um, were uh, both focusing on in, in some ways was whether somebody had experienced a moral injury, uh, which is a bit different from how is that moral injury affecting you now? How are you functioning because you experienced that moral injury? Is the fact that you experienced that causing you distress? Is it causing you ongoing what we might call functional impairment? Is it, is it getting in the way in important places in your life, at work or in your family relationships or in leisure or when, in whatever? So the expressions of moral injury scale was one of the first attempts to try and get at, okay, not just did you experience an event, but what are what you know are the current sort of manifestations of that, so to speak, uh, and that is focused on again a military population um, with with that scale. Our group then uh, developed this brief moral injury screen. Uh, I'll show you more of that in, in a little bit here, uh, and some of our findings there. That's a seven-item measure. Um, but actually can be even briefer than that. So it was uh, developed and intended to be a screening measure uh, for moral injury. Uh, the first three items, as you'll see, uh, map pretty closely to Litz's definition and get at moral injury event. Um, if you do not endorse any of those first three items, then you're done with the scale. Um, if you haven't experienced a moral injurious event, then we don't ask any more questions. Uh, if you have uh, experienced one, if you endorse at least one of those, then you answer the next four questions, which get at sequela, um, and, and you'll see uh, some examples of that. This is intended as a screen, uh, not necessarily a measure that would be used um, to look at kind of ongoing care of somebody uh, with moral injury. Uh, much longer measure that was put out there by Harold Koenig and colleagues, uh, moral injury symptom scale. You can see that's a 45 item measure with numerous different subscales uh, that they have on that measure. Uh, and then this last one here, the moral injury outcome scale, um, it's a 14 item measure. Um, if you try to find it and look it up, you're gonna go, you told me about this measure that's out there, but I'm not quite finding it. Um, You'll find a paper on the international consortium that came together to develop this scale. Uh, right now, the manuscript uh, that has the scale in it and, and findings uh, around kind of validation of this scale um, is, is under review and, and should be coming out soon. So this um, is a scale that I would commend to folks who are wanting to measure moral injury because um, it was uh, developed as a result of this um, international consortium, and they did lots of cognitive interviewing with uh, veterans and various things to develop this measure. Um, and you can see again with this measure, these two different subscales, shame related and trust violation related. Again, hopefully you're kind of hearing those two different uh, definitions of moral injury coming out here. Um, shame related likely relating more to transgressions, perceived transgressions by yourself, trust violation, likely relating more to that conception of moral injury as a betrayal. Um, I'm not going to show you all these scales, but I do want to give you a sense of what are some of these sorts of items? What are some of the things that, that we're asking about? So this is that first measure, that moral injury event scale. It is the one that has been uh, most widely used, uh, again, largely because it, it was it was published first, and it has the two subscales. So the first six items load on that transgression subscale, and then uh, seven through nine uh, load on the betrayal subscale. Ten and eleven here are grayed out. They initially tested those, those items, but dropped them. So it's it's actually a nine-item scale. Um, but just to you know highlight a few of these items here. Uh, number one, I saw things that were morally wrong. Uh, agree to disagree. Um, I, am tr I am troubled by having witnessed others' immoral acts. That's the second one there. Um, the fourth item, I am troubled by having acted in ways that violated my own morals or values. So those two items, actually, items two and four, uh, we used um, in a study uh, in conjunction with some of my colleagues at Duke and at Vanderbilt 
where we were looking um, at potential moral injury uh, or looking at agreement with these items uh, within a sample of healthcare workers during the pandemic. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a little while. Uh, you can see then these betrayal items. I feel betrayed by leaders who I once trusted or by service members or by others outside the US or military who I once trusted. Um, this scale here is the uh, first scale that Joe Courier uh, published, Moral Injury Questionnaire, against the military version. Um, a lot of data <laughs> on this uh, slide, and we don't need to get lost in all that. Uh, this is a, a table from their publication where they compared a community sample uh, of veterans. So these were uh, veterans who were in this community sample to a clinical sample of veterans. The clinical sample was veterans who were in treatment uh, for PTSD. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the items, but just to kind of highlight some of the ones uh, with the highest mean scores. So you can see, you know, the M is the average score uh, for a given item. So you can see the, the mean scores for a community sample and for the clinical sample. And as you look down those columns, you can tell that the clinical sample you know, had higher scores on uh, virtually all of these items. Uh, but the first one, uh, there was one that the clinical sample scored quite high on. So things I saw or experienced in the war left me feeling betrayed uh, or let down by military and political leaders. Um, we skip down here to number nine, I feel guilt for surviving when others didn't. Uh, number 12, I experienced tragic war zone events that were chaotic and beyond my control. Um, number 18, seeing so much death has changed me. Uh, so you can see those are just some of the items and the ones that I just highlighted there um, being uh, particularly highly endorsed uh, in, that, in that clinical sample. Um, this then is our measure, uh, our brief moral injury screen. Um, as I said, those first three items you need to endorse or agree with. So you need to circle a two or a three on one of those first three items to then answer items uh, four through seven. As you look at those first three items, uh, you'll note that those first three items map very closely to the definition uh, provided by um, Brett Litz and colleagues. So during my time in the war zone, number one, I witnessed morally wrong acts. Number two, I did not stop morally wrong acts, even though I could have. And number three, I did things that were morally wrong. Uh, if you do agree with at least one of those three, uh, we then invite folks to answer um, the next four questions. Uh, I won't read those out, but they essentially focus um, on your perception of yourself, others, and the world. Um, as moral or not. Uh, so kind of really looking at um, your subjective sense of how these events have affected uh, perceptions of morality, your own, others, um, and the world in general. Uh, and I, so I wanna share a few findings from work that we've done um, using this scale uh, in a population of post 9-11 veterans. Uh, so the data that you see here is from a project that we did with a little over 300 um, post 9-11 veterans who were recruited from a repository that uh, exists here um, in, in Durham, North Carolina. So most of these veterans were North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, sort of the mid-Atlantic uh, region. Um, and we sent all of them a 40-page questionnaire. So we asked about a lot more um, than uh, just this seven item uh, brief moral injury screen. We had a whole host of different things that we were asking about uh, as, as part of this project. Um, one of them was uh, our brief moral injury screen. And, and what you can see here is that 44% of our sample endorsed at least one of those morally injurious events from our screen. So they endorsed at least one of those first three items. Um, and if we break that down you know, a, a little bit more specifically, uh, what you can see here is that um, 130 of the veterans in our sample, or 42%, endorsed that first item, endorsed witnessing something, right? Um, or said uh, that they, they witnessed morally wrong acts. So that is depicted you know, by this 
uh, circle here. That's a total of 130 out of our 315, sample of 315, who said that they uh, witnessed a morally wrong act. That second question then, um, I, um, I did not stop morally wrong acts, even though I could have 18% uh, of our sample. So that's this 57 total or 18% of our sample um, agreed with that item. And then the third item, uh, I did things that were morally wrong. 13% of our sample or, or 41 veterans uh, agreed with that item. And the, and the reason that these circles are uh, overlapping is what you're seeing here is that uh, the vast majority, nearly everybody who agreed with that second item also agreed with the first item, right? There were only three individuals who agreed with that second item who said, I failed to stop something that did not endorse witnessing. So nearly everybody uh, who said that they either did something uh, that they perceived as morally wrong or failed to, to stop something uh, also said that they witnessed uh, something that was morally wrong. What we did with these groups then was we broke our sample um, into four different subgroups. Uh, and I'm going to walk through these bottom up. So the, the first group that we looked at were those individuals who agreed with this third question who agreed that I did things that were morally wrong. So that's 13% of our sample or 41 individuals. The next group we looked at were um, those individuals who agreed with this second question. So people who said I did not stop morally wrong acts even though I could have, but didn't agree with number three. So they said, you know, I, I should have stopped something, but I didn't do something myself. Right. OK, so so we're not looking at the entirety of this purple circle. We're just looking at at this part here, you know, just the purple part that you can see um, people that said I I failed to stop something, but I didn't do something. Uh, and we then looked at folks who said that I witnessed something but didn't agree with either of these things. So that is, these are individuals who are saying I witnessed something that was morally wrong, but, you know, I. I don't really have kind of culpability. I, I didn't fail to prevent something or I didn't do something. Okay, so that that's 21% of our sample. So we broke folks into three those three different categories, and then of course we had our fourth category, about half our sample, who did not agree uh, with any of those items, who didn't endorse any type of moral injury experience. Once we broke folks into those four different groupings. We looked at them, and you can see that this is this is color coded to correspond to that previous slide. We looked at them on a whole host of uh, different measures that were all included in this, you know, 40-page questionnaire packet that we sent out. Um, and what you can see um, first, with respect to our brief moral injury screen, we had those subsequent four questions on moral injury sequela or the extent to which you perceive yourself, others in the world as, as moral. Those, of course, who didn't endorse any moral injury didn't answer those questions, so we don't have a dot here. Uh, but as we move from that group of individuals who said they witnessed something to individuals who said they failed to prevent something, to individuals who said that they did something, you can see that we have increasing symptomatology, so to speak. So um, greater uh, average, on average, um, that these folks are saying, you know, I don't perceive myself, others, or, or the world as, as moral. Um, then we looked at uh, a whole range of different mental health problems. So we looked at PTSD, we looked at alcohol, we looked at depression, we looked at suicidality, we looked at drug abuse, um, and you can see a relatively consistent pattern uh, across all of these where individuals in these latter two groups, so people who said, you know, I failed to stop something or I did something, so kind of that perceived culpability, individuals in those groups had the highest uh, symptomatology on measures of PTSD, alcohol abuse, depression, suicidality, we're, we're actually, you know, seeing that kind of across all those groups. And a little bit of a bump here, that's not statistically significant, but actually a little bit of a bump with those people who said I failed to prevent something. 
um, which is intriguing, but again, I don't want to make too much of it because it's, it's not statistically significant. Uh, and then drug abuse. Uh, so the, the overall pattern here being that experiencing a moral injury event uh, does have a substantial influence on all sorts of uh, mental health functioning and, and, and drug abuse uh, and even suicidality. Um, that even just witnessing an event, even if you don't feel like you have culpability, does tend to, um, on a lot of these measures, um, place you at, at higher risk for more symptomatology. But we are especially seeing that among individuals who kind of perceive some of this culpability, you know, who feel like either they failed to prevent or, or did something uh, that was morally wrong. Um, one other thing that we that we did as kind of a follow up to some of that quantitative research that I was just showing you uh, is more qualitative research with a subset of these veterans. Uh, so among the post 9-11 veterans who um, agreed or endorsed having a moral injury experience, um, we followed up with a subset of them and did some intensive interviewing to ask, what, what was it uh, that you experienced? Can you tell us a little bit more um, about that uh, experience? Um, and one of the interesting things I think to, to come out of that, so that Heather King and Kimber Perry and others kind of really anchored a lot of that um, qualitative uh, research as you can see here, and I'm not going to, you know, read these different statements. I'll, I'll let you do that. But things that are not kind of as prototypically thought of um, as moral injury came out of uh, a lot of those interviews. Um, so, you know, as I was starting with uh, in this presentation, I was talking about research on killing, um, and that's something that's certainly thought of and talked about a lot. Um, especially, you know, experiences of, um, you know, witnessing or participating in the, the deaths of, of civilians or of, of children, right, these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, I've worked with veterans who have been part of those uh, kinds of experiences, and certainly there's moral injury there. Um, but intriguingly, you know, these are very different categories, reputation smearing, uh, animal abuse, fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, some of you may have, you know, read the book or seen the movie uh, Unbroken. Um, it's, a, it's a book by uh, Laura Hildebrand, and I think Angelina Jolie made it into a, a movie that was pretty popular a, a number of years back. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the movie, it's, it's, it tracks, you know, the real life story of um, this guy, uh, Louis Zamperini. So he was an Olympic caliber runner, right? He was, he was a really good runner. He's probably going to go to the Olympics. World War II happens. So instead of going to the Olympics, he's, you know, um, in the military and fighting World War II, ends up being a pilot. Plane gets shot down over the Pacific. They're in the Pacific for like weeks on end. It's, it's insane in this little raft and, and, you know, dying of like dehydration and, and starvation. And they've got, sharks attacking this raft and then miraculously this thing you know gets in some current and finally makes it to an island only for him to become a prisoner of war and then you know his japanese captors you know torture him just like all the other pow's and then they find out oh you were going to be an olympian right so then they target him because it's like oh mr hero so he really just like receives you know incredible amounts of abuse and torture and all of this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, for folks who've seen the movie, you may remember some of those scenes. In the book, he's asked, you know, out of all this terrible stuff he experienced, what was the most distressing? And the thing that he said was most distressing was when he was in this POW camp, there was like a little kitten that used to walk around the camp um, you know, it just kind of just kind of was a little ray of 
tiny little ray of sunshine for these POWs. They saw this little kid and walked by. And then one day, you know, one of the prison guards just shot it. And he said, you know, out of everything he experienced, that was the thing. You know, all this bodily torture and stuff. You would think he would select that, but he, he said it was, that was the thing that was most distressing for him. Um, so I think you know, there's, there's a lesson in that, and I think a lesson in some of, you know, this qualitative research that we've done that we can't just necessarily assume ourselves, you know, when we hear somebody's story and we go, wow, gosh, you went through that. I can't imagine it. We can't necessarily assume that what we think would be most morally injurious is necessarily what that individual uh, experienced as, as morally injurious. And, you know, in, in the case of, of animal abuse or something like that, you know, we could kind of come up with reasons for why that would be really distressing and whatnot. But we, we really need to hear from the individual and allow them to tell their story, uh, not necessarily assume that the parts that stick out to us are going to be the parts that stick out to them as much. Uh, and so, you know, as I've kind of already um, alluded to, um, and, you know, as is, is pretty expected, over the course of moral injury being developed within um, work with veterans and military populations, a lot of folks have said, this, this experience is not something that is confined to being in the military. In fact, th some of those experiences that, that I was just showing you and talking about um, are not even experiences that are necessarily themselves confined to the military. There, there were experiences that veterans had while they were in the military, but the, some of those experiences are things that you could absolutely have outside uh, of military context. And so, um, Various different contexts where, where moral injury has been looked at. Um, it's been looked at with respect to childhood abuse, uh, neglect, and incest. Uh, we can think about that in a variety of different ways, you know, especially we know, um, you know, from work that, that we do with adults who have PTSD, those who have suffered some of these kinds of experiences, what we sometimes refer to adverse childhood events or ACEs, A-C-E-S, um, you know, are, are at risk for experiencing uh, worse PTSD symptomatology and suicidality, especially if they experience future traumas. Uh, so these, you know, sorts of things from a trauma perspective um, are, are very concerning. We can think about it from a moral perspective, perhaps even more so, right? Our morality is based on relationships with other people and it's developed in, in, in these social contexts. And if as a child, you're having some of those things broken, you know, what does that do to your morality? And then over time, if you start to develop trust and that's broken again, and you have this history, right? So lots of uh, different ways that we can, you know, imagine that being important developmentally uh, over time and, and how it would affect uh, experiences of moral injury. Um, among refugees and displaced persons, there's been some work, um, especially among uh, individuals who've experienced persecution or, or torture, uh, among healthcare workers, and I'm going to talk about uh, that and share uh, some information there uh, in just a moment. Um, Joe Curry and others have looked at um, teachers, educators in El Salvador uh, who've been in um, challenging or traumatic situations and looked at uh, potential moral injury in that context. Uh, moral injury has been looked at among police officers, uh, especially those who are in situations where they inflict harm or may kill in the line of duty. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working with a group right now uh, who's looking at this um, in a prison context uh, and within prisons, you can think about it in terms of, um, you know, prisoners or incarcerated persons, uh, as well as those who work within the prison system, right? There's all sorts of, of different angles uh, and ways that we could um, think about moral injury, and I think it has uh, broad applicability. Uh, but what I do want to focus on a, a little bit is this topic of what about healthcare workers uh, during COVID, right? 
Um, and from quite early on in the pandemic, uh, this question was being asked and uh, there were quite a few uh, different articles, um, you know, most of them commentaries and editorials and thought pieces um, in uh, major journals. So I've just, you know, selected a few of them here from early on in the pandemic, uh, where folks were speculating about the potential uh, for moral injury among healthcare workers uh, during COVID-19. Um, at this point, there's still been a lot more speculation about this topic than research because it takes a lot less time to write a thought piece or an editorial or a commentary uh, than to develop a study and get IRB approval and send out the measures and get the data and analyze the data and all this kind of thing. But there have been some uh, studies that, that have been done. So a lot of folks early on um, we're saying, you know, I think something might be going on here. Now, the research that's been done, um, as I, I think I, I don't need to tell this group, um, where we've been at in the pandemic, um, you know, our fears and our experiences have changed over time, uh, right? From early in the pandemic, the experience of being a healthcare worker the last winter's surge to this winter's surge, you know, even the question in the chat just before we went to the break of healthcare workers earlier on were seen as heroes. And now a lot of us, we feel like we're almost villains, at least to, to patients and families sometimes. I mean, what a different experience, right, than, than earlier on in this pandemic. And so I named that to say some of the research here in our empirical findings you know, this, this research has been done at different points uh, during the pandemic, and I've tried to name uh, those different time frames here uh, because the time frame, the place, and all that kind of stuff, um, I think it affects uh, some of the experience. Um, all of this to say, and I'll walk through these, the experience of moral injury, what we're seeing from the literature so far is it does have resonance, yes, for for healthcare workers. So this um, first study that you see here, so I've kind of broken up with this table, who the participants are, the sample size. I put the time frame in there because of those issues I was just talking about. Um, we can think about, you know, where we were at in the pandemic at, at these different points in time uh, and then findings. So that first study was uh, conducted among um, healthcare workers at a medical center in Baltimore. Um, and found that higher scores on a measure of moral injury were correlated with spending more time on an inpatient clinical unit. So that's a bit what we would expect. Healthcare workers who were in contexts um, that were higher risks or the moral dilemmas um, were more acute, right? Um, and there was uh, potential for more death and serious illness and these sorts of things. Uh, that those would be the individuals who uh, might have higher scores on a measure of moral injury. And that is, in fact, what this study found. Uh, another study from um, early in the pandemic, so you can see these first two both being from uh, spring of 2020, uh, right early on. So another one was done with healthcare workers in Romania. Um, nearly half of them reported exposure to potentially morally injurious events. Um, and that figure actually tracks pretty closely uh, with what our team has found in, in some of our research uh, among healthcare workers. Um, another study, this one uh, just from last spring uh, of 2021, looked at physicians in the UK, physicians who were working with COVID-19 patients. Uh, and what uh, they found in that study was that two thirds of these physicians once they learned about moral injury, uh, said that the concept really resonated with their experiences during the pandemic. So two thirds of physicians saying that this concept of moral injury resonated uh, with their experience uh, providing care during the pandemic. Now, again, I've already noted this, but I'm gonna note it again. We don't have a cut point for moral injury. 
So this we're not saying X percent have moral injury because there's no such thing right now. There isn't a cut point where we say these people have moral injury and these people don't. Um, but two thirds of physicians saying that, you know, that concept resonates with their experience. I, that strikes me as a pretty high, uh, pretty high percentage. Um, in, in our work, um, we've got a manuscript under review right now, so I'm not going to talk about the specific, you know, kind of data and those sorts of things, but I can talk about it uh, kind of in, in general strokes. Uh, so we've conducted one of the uh, first studies, to my awareness anyway, where we've been able to actually compare um, a sample of combat veterans, uh, which is where uh, almost all of the empirical work on moral injury has been done today, to a sample of healthcare workers uh, during the pandemic. So our sample of combat veterans, a little over uh, 600 combat veterans who uh, completed those items, uh, moral injury items that I highlighted from the uh, moral injury event scale earlier, uh, and then uh, a little over 2,000 healthcare workers um, who were working in healthcare during the pandemic who also answered those same uh, items. Um, what we found was we, we found that just on those items, so you'll note on this, this slide, I'm talking about potential moral injury, P, PMI, I've, I've used that acronym here, because uh, I want to be careful not to call it moral injury, right? This is just agreement with a couple of different items, but still I think is, is quite indicative, especially when we're able to compare combat veterans uh, and healthcare workers. Uh, we find that their rates of agreement on these uh, items are uh, pretty similar to one another, right? Um, uh, pretty common and, and relatively in line with that percentage I was showing you earlier from our brief moral injury screen where we had, um, you know, nearly half, 44% of our um, post 9-11 veterans endorsing at least one of those uh, moral injury event items. Uh, so, so quite common. Um, in both populations. Uh, in both populations, we see that having uh, some kind of experience endorsing a potential moral injury experience, uh, both among veterans and among healthcare workers, is associated with higher levels of depression, uh, with uh, lower quality of life, uh, and then among healthcare workers associated with higher levels of burnout. Um, we also have been able to look at some uh, key demographics um, and the associations there with potential moral injury. Um, and without getting into some of the specifics of that, we were, we were looking at um, regression equations where we were controlling for different variables. Um, but we found that there were some demographic characteristics associated with potential moral injury that are suggestive of um, some of the things that Jonathan Shea really noted in, in his definition of moral injury and sort of this idea of betrayal by an authority or of betrayal by others. And, and again, even that comment just before the break, feeling betrayed even by patients or by society right now. Um, what we saw with some of these demographics was that some of these characteristics that might be associated with kind of lower um, authority or, or lower social power um, were associated with higher levels of potential moral injury, which, which is uh, kind of what we would expect from that uh, Jonathan Shea sort of definition. If, if being in a position of authority matters or not being in a position of authority, feeling like, um, you know, maybe you're being asked to do something that goes against your moral code or feel like you, you know, there's really no way out of this situation, you know, perceived control um, is important uh, and that the context that, that we find ourselves in uh, are important for, for these uh, potentially morally injurious experiences. Um, so hopefully that research will actually come out here in a, in a few weeks, who knows, you know, these things always take a, a bit of time, um, you know, Obviously, more research that needs to be done over time. You know, we're comparing a sample of combat veterans from post 9/11 era who've had quite some time to reflect on their experience 
to a, a sample of healthcare workers right in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, so lots of limitations that way, you know, how will this play out for healthcare workers and all these kind of things. I don't want to say that these two samples, you know, that their experiences are, are completely analogous, uh, but we are finding things uh, that certainly uh, are suggestive that moral injury um, is, a, is a useful construct to consider uh, among healthcare workers. Uh, somebody brought up this notion of moral distress earlier, uh, and I very much want to name. So I'm talking about moral injury today. I'm talking about a construct that's been developed with military veterans and it's kind of now been applied to healthcare and other contexts and whatnot. Within the nursing literature, they were way ahead on this, right? Back in the 1980s, um, Andrew Jameson is uh, writing about moral distress, right? And so uh, his definition is here, a phenomenon in which one knows the right action to take, but is constrained from taking it. So that definition is a little bit different than what we're talking about with moral injury, but you can see Again, how somebody's experience could fall both into that category and into, you know, a moral injury category. A fair amount of research has been done since, you know, this idea came out in the 1980s um, on moral distress uh, among nurses and among healthcare workers. Uh, and it's been found to be correlated with a number of things, uh, as we might expect greater burnout, uh, increased compassion fatigue, and then a, a more poorly perceived ethical climate. And I think that one's interesting because I think it might uh, relate a little bit to, to what we see with, you know, these notions of betrayal by authority. You know, if you're in an ethical climate where you feel like you kind of can't get out or you, you, you know, don't have a positive view of that ethical climate, uh, it can put you in, a, in morally distressing uh, situations. So how do these terms relate to one another? Um, neither moral distress nor moral injury has sort of these firm cut points. They aren't diagnoses, as I've talked about, but I do think it's helpful to conceptualize them along a continuum. So this is um, a figure or a heuristic that was put out there by, by Litz and Kerrig as part of a special issue on moral injury uh, a couple of years ago in, in the Journal of Traumatic Stress. Um, and so they um, conceptualize moral injury as something that has relatively low prevalence in the population. So um, this is not a super high occurrence kind of thing and moral in injurious events are relatively rare, okay? So events that would cause moral injury are fairly rare and it, and it has a fairly rare population prevalence. You know, we don't have a cut point, but kind of the notion is that moral injury would be somewhere more on the severe um, or extreme end of uh, moral uh, distress and, and causing more severe psychological, social, spiritual harm. Moral distress then in this schematic would be, you know, a bit more common as would, would moral stressors, but kind of maybe somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, and then we can all think about, you know, kind of experiences of moral frustration that we have, you know, potentially on a daily basis in interactions with coworkers and, uh, you know, family members and whatever, you know, moral, different moral challenges that we might run into uh, are much more common, but, you know, wouldn't have as profound an impact on um, kind of our psychological, social, spiritual uh, distress. Uh, so, I mean, those are not hard and fast categories. Uh, but I find that schematic and continuum kind of helpful to think about uh, where things fall um, on, on this continuum of, of terminology uh, that's out there. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is take uh, maybe um, five to ten minutes, say we can take till say 1120, um, and I, I want to pause here before I go into the next part of my um, presentation and talk about interventions um, and just pose this question for the chat or for the Q&A. Um, have you observed moral distress or injury within healthcare workers during the pandemic um, or any other questions that may come up? So, Brent, if there's anything that we don't have to necessarily go through them in order, uh, I, I think we'll just take a few minutes here. We probably don't have time to get through everything, but if there's anything as you look at 
some of the Q&A or the chat uh, that might be useful to highlight. I want to take a moment just now to make space for that. All right, I'll be glad to clear some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, so this first one is a holdover from our previous session, uh, but it says, what facts, circumstances, conditions do you see uh, must be established empirically or otherwise so as to facilitate the creation of a diagnosis of moral injury in the DSM so that veterans can be compensated for their wartime injury as vets who have been diagnosed with PTSD? Yeah, um, I'm not uh, a way to do that would be to create some kind of gold standard diagnosis, right? So with everything that exists in the DSM, you know, we, we have things like uh, the structured clinical interview for the DSM or the SCID, uh, SCID. Um, and you can walk through that and ask all the diagnostic questions for all the different disorders that exist in the DSM and either somebody you know, has it or doesn't. Um, and then in, in our research, what we can do is we can, we can go, okay, you know, we've done um, you know, a project where we've, we've used the SCID, we've gone through this diagnostic interview, which is the gold standard to establish whether somebody has a diagnosis, and then we compare that to you know, scores on the effect depression inventory or on the PCL or, you know, whatever, some kind of measure of, um, you know, uh, psychological symptom severity. And then we can look at how well those are correlated and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, if, if a diagnosis for moral injury was to be established, you know, you could conceivably come up with that, that sort of, those sorts of questions and terminology. Um, as it stands, um, I think it's an open question the extent to which veterans who have experienced moral injury are already receiving compensation and care as part of PTSD diagnoses, and to what extent there are veterans with moral injury who are not receiving that. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I know just enough about the compensation and pension process and all this kind of thing to know that, you know, it's multifaceted and there, you know, you can um, uh, attempt to um, apply for that multiple times and all these kind of things. So, you know, whether through that process, moral injury can be captured to some extent or not, I, I don't, I don't know. That's kind of a, kind of an open question. Thank you. The next question that, that you may want to uh, follow up on, but I just want to add it to the discussion here. The comment was, I, I would guess war is not necessary for moral injury to occur. If a person hurts someone intentionally on the sports field, if someone attempts suicide, if someone kills someone in a car wreck or in road rage situation, these situations and others have moral implications. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, what, one of the things that uh, certainly I've seen with a number of combat veterans is sometimes it's those sorts of experiences. You know, it's it's they were they were in Af Afghanistan and they were driving a vehicle and that vehicle crashed into somebody. Well, yeah, that can happen. That, that can happen <laughs> in the U.S. You don't need to be in in combat uh, for for something like that to happen. And maybe you're texting somebody when that happens, or maybe you had a little bit too much to drink when that happens, or, you know, right? So, so maybe you do have some moral culpability, right? So like, ab absolutely. Uh, I think this is something that um, occurs in, in lots of other contexts. Um, you know, when I think about just the, the work that's done with trauma survivors, but also, you know, even even persons who may not be trauma survivors, but experiencing, you know, depressive disorders and that kind of thing. I, I think there's a, a lot of room um, within that work to uh, more intentionally attend to, to some of these kinds of moral issues. 
Thank you. We have a couple of questions that are related to the correlation between moral injury and maturity. Uh, whether that is developmental maturity, comment made about uh, most military personnel are in their late teens and early 20s, or just other factors that enable someone to mature and develop over time and therefore perhaps be more resilient to moral injury. But both questions relate to that relationship between maturity and incidents of moral injury. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I th I, that's a... That's a um... I think it's a very interesting question developmentally. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hesitate to proclaim that I know in all circumstances how to identify somebody who's more or less morally mature than the next person. <laughs> um, but I think that the question um, is spot on in and I know I hear this a lot from military chaplains, uh, and, and I, I don't mean to say that I'm, I'm, I'm shifting a little bit because I don't want to say these these people are more morally mature than these other people. But uh, the way that young people have been formed morally in our country um, has changed pretty markedly um, over the last few generations, uh, a major place for moral formation um you know 50 60 years ago um and still now for many americans is within faith communities right uh when i talk to military chaplains a lot of them uh say and and so again hear me clearly i am not saying oh those who are formed one way have more moral maturity than others but but it is different it's a different moral formation if you've not been part of a community that regularly meets and intentionally talks and thinks about moral experiences, uh, you know, if your moral formation isn't that, um, it's, it's something different. Are you getting it from, from Facebook and groups that you're on, you know, with social media and that kind of thing? I, I sort you know, that's something that I hear a fair amount from, you know, military chaplains now saying that a lot of, um, you know, young service members don't have any kind of frame of reference even for uh, a faith tradition. Uh, and I, I'm not trying to pass judgment, but it is, that's just different. It's just a different moral formation. Um, and so, yes, those things uh, absolutely matter. And, and I think, and, I, and I'll get to this, you know, as I talk about interventions, so I'll, I'll, I'll probably make this just the last question and just shift right from this, Brent, and if we have time at the end, we can shift to more questions. But um, with the interventions uh, that we've developed within VA, um, many of them approach moral injury through group interventions, kind of group therapy in these co-led chaplain mental health groups. Uh, one of the reasons I think that's important is because morality is communally interpreted, right? I mean, if, if we think about some of the most basic moral principles, like, I, you know, I don't know, I haven't done a survey on this, you know, I'd, I'd like to show data, and you've seen that so far, I'd like to give you a percentage. But my guess is, if you asked people, like, what is the most basic moral precept, a lot of people would probably cite the golden rule, right? Like, do unto other people as you want them to do unto you. You know, certainly if you look in the Christian tradition, that's kind of essentially what Jesus boiled the whole thing down to, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So like some, some variant of that, whether you're from a faith tradition or not, sort of that golden rule mentality. Well, you think about that, well, what's that about? That's about how we, <laughs> that's about how we live life together. Like the, the moral principle, I think that a lot of people would think of is, is some kind of social, communal, principle, how, how to interact with other people, not, not how I do me by myself somewhere. Um, and so because of that, I, I think it's in, important and it's one of the reasons that when um, we're approaching moral injury uh, within you know, some of these uh, groups that we're um, helping to um, you know, kind of facilitate and, and grow within the VA context, that having folks 
talk about these things in community with one another uh, is important. Um, and so I know that may have shifted a little bit, you know, from the uh, initial question, but but this notion of you know moral maturity, I, th I think our our morality, and if you want to use the you know the term maturity or development, that this is it's something that um, we humans develop in uh, community in, in some capacity uh, with one another and in social relationships um, with with one another. And so, and so in some way, I think it's important to bring that understanding um, into how we're attempting to provide care for moral injury. Uh, so with that, I'll um, kind of transition into sort of this last part here and um, we will have an exercise at, at some point as, as part of this last part before we end, and then we'll, we'll just see if we have uh, time after that for um, any more questions or reflections, but appreciate uh, everybody's thoughtfulness so far. Um, so I wanna ask a similar question as I did with measurement. Uh, so with measurement, I asked, should we even be measuring this thing? Um, as I get into intervention, who should be treating, and I use the scare quotes there, who should, who should be treating moral injury? Um, and I, I think we should be questioning a little bit if we're using the terminology of treatment, what, is, what does that all mean and what does that imply and what roads does that kind of send us down and nudge us in the direction of and what paths are we then maybe not going down as a result. Um, when we use this term treatment, I think it implies potentially kind of a cure to a disease or to a disorder. Um, and I know there are reasons to think about that direction, but there are also reasons to be skeptical uh, of uh, conceptualizing moral injury as such. Um, so one alternative that I've, I've listed here is what about thinking of the care of persons who have moral injury as, as the objective of that being to promote reintegration into a community where one can have value and purpose. Um, and maybe that'll go along with some kind of symptom reduction on a measure. Um, and, I, and a measure can ask about, you know, integration into community where you have value and purpose. So it's like measurement can be uh, an important part of all this. Um, but what about thinking of moral injury more holistically to include those kind of things? And if and if we do think of um, the care of moral injury more holistically that way, um, at least for my part, from a mental health perspective, it invites thinking about collaborative care approaches with all sorts of different um, care providers and even individuals and communities. So, you know, certainly psychologists and counselors and social workers should be part of this, psychiatrists, uh, but also, you know, as I've been talking about, and I'll say a bit more um, here in a moment, you know, chaplains or even, you know, community clergy, potentially. Uh, I don't think that um, everybody needs to be attending church. I don't think that everybody with moral injury needs to go back to church. That's not for everybody. Uh, but for some individuals, that could be restorative. Um, and beneficial for them? Uh, and if so, how, how can we um, have these connections um, to communities um, that are, you know, meaningful uh, social networks for people, uh, whatever those may be? How can we think more holistic uh, about the uh, care of persons, in, including potentially ourselves, right, um, uh, with, with you know, moral injury or, or moral distress um, as as part of, you know, this conversation. Um, so I want to talk a, a little bit about some work that we've done, you know, integrating chaplaincy and, and mental health. So a few years ago, we did uh, a survey of chaplains in the VA and in uh, DOD, stands for Department of Defense or military. Uh, so you can see this graph here. Uh, is breaking up our VA chaplains from chaplains in the Army, Navy, and Air Force, 
and includes Marine chaplains. By the way, if anybody's going, where are the Marines? Uh, the Navy chaplains serve the Marines. So that, that's all the uh, you know active duty forces. Um, we asked um, a couple different questions about moral injury. One was, how often do you see veterans or how often do you see service members with moral injury? Uh, you can see around 80% uh, in the military, 90% in the VA said at least sometimes, and around half of our VA chaplains said frequently. Of course, chaplains function in a VA context or in healthcare, and so you're, you're, you're seeing people who are more likely to be in all kinds of different distress. Um, and then we also ask these chaplains, how well has your training prepared you uh, to care for veterans or for service members with moral injury? Uh, and we saw that nearly 100% uh, of chaplains who took this survey said that they're at least somewhat prepared, and around two-thirds said that they're very prepared. Now, we didn't just ask about moral injury. We asked uh, these two questions about a whole bunch of different things. So. How often do you see people with PTSD and with depression and with legal problems and with, you know, relationship problems? And how well has your training uh, prepared you to care for all these different things? This data really stands out as an area where chaplains said, now this is something that my training has really prepared me um, to care for, right? Uh, and if you're on this call today, I know we have a number of, uh, you know, chaplains on this call. If you're on this call and you're not familiar with chaplains, um, you know, Brent, I should probably give the mic to you right now to like say what chaplains do. But if, if you're on this call and you're going, well, wait a minute, you know, aren't chaplains just their particular tradition? That, don't they just like proselytize to people? No, <laughs> that is not what chaplains do, especially in healthcare context. So. If, if that's education to you, uh, and that's the only thing you take from, from this training today, that's a good thing. Um, chaplains are there to, to journey alongside, to walk alongside people from any faith tradition, from any spiritual tradition, or from none at all. Uh, and, and so I think in this area of moral injury, when, when people are having these existential and moral struggles, you know, chaplains are a great resource uh, in many of our systems to be individuals who can who can walk alongside and really understand and interpret and care for uh, individuals with with these struggles. Um, so I don't want to belabor some of these points, but in um, our integrative mental health program, we have for over a decade done a lot of work um, integrating chaplains and mental health care providers in all sorts of different domains, including with respect to moral injury. Um, Veterans and service members have all sorts of distinctive motivations for why they might want to turn to clergy. Uh, lots of people just in the population in general with mental health struggles uh, will turn to clergy. But, you know, if you've been through the military, the chaplain, you know, it's that person with absolute confidentiality. Often they're embedded with with the unit. And so chaplains are, are kind of particularly understood um, as as often uh, trusted individuals. Um, as I you know, mentioned earlier, a lot of veterans with PTSD turning to VA have these sorts of existential struggles. Uh, and so you know, we, we really just think for a whole host of different reasons, a, a collaborative care approach makes a lot of sense here. Um, and if you're interested uh, you know, about that specifically, um, you know, there's a lot more information on our, on our website and invite folks you know, to sort of look into that that you know, I'm not going to go into. What I do want to talk about is a particular project that we've been invested in for the last maybe three or yeah three years or so. Um, a uh, what we've called a dynamic diffusion network, where we've brought together teams of mental health and chaplain providers who've co-led efforts focusing either on suicide prevention. So that's these. Um, you know, dark blue little markers on the map. So these these teams have all focused together. These are chaplain mental health pairs who have focused on suicide prevention, uh, and then a whole uh, separate group of individuals who focused on moral injury care. Uh, so you can see here uh, a list of uh, seven different teams uh, across VA uh, that have all been providing co-led uh, mental health chaplain groups for moral injury. 
Uh, and our intention with this network was to bring together these teams that are doing some pretty novel stuff. Um, at present, there is not one sort of singular best practice for addressing moral injury. Uh, people are developing these interventions, you know, as as we speak, right? This is this is uh, new territory, uh, and so we wanted to bring together some of the you know teams that we knew of that were doing uh, cutting edge work in this area uh, to share their practices uh, with one another and to learn from one another, and for us to learn from them. You know, what is it that you're doing that's really working? You know, what can we share with other places? Um, and so we've, we've learned a lot from that, uh, and, I'll, and I'll share on, on the next slide some of the core components that we've learned uh, from these different sites. This image that I have here um, on the screen, perhaps some folks know what this is, sort of, sort of that, you know, gold stuff uh, going through the pot there. So this is um, a clip art version of uh, Kintsugi, which is um, a, a Japanese practice for taking, um, you know, broken pottery or broken bowls and then filling it with precious metals, you know, gold or, or silver or platinum or things. And, 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 and sort of the notion or the metaphor here is, you know, that, that pot that was broken, you're not just going to glue it back together and it's going to be the same pot that it was before. You know, it, it has broken. It's a different pot now. But that doesn't mean that it can't still be beautiful, right? And that there that healing can't occur, and that's something different um, and new, uh, and perhaps something you know that that even acknowledges um, that out of those broken places, uh, beauty can sometimes emerge. Uh, that sort of philosophy and metaphor um, and Chaplains are involved in all these groups, so there's different rituals. Um, some of the groups do some drawing stuff, and and uh, even you know will do some of this kind of pottery kind of thing to to work with these metaphors. But that sort of idea uh, is one thing that is really, in different ways, um, a commonality uh, across uh, all of all of these different groups in VA. Um, we have a manuscript under review right now where we've actually picked out uh, a number of additional commonalities that we see um, from all of these different groups. And I'm not going to uh, belabor all of these, but I'll kind of walk through them uh, quickly. So all of them have a clear conceptualization of moral injury, and that conceptual conceptualization guides what they do. So I've, I've talked about sort of the you know transgression-based versus betrayal-based. Um, understandings of moral injury. So really clearly understanding what your group is intended to target and then making sure that individuals who are coming into your group uh, benefit from that. So that conceptualization of moral injury is uh, very important. Uh, all of them are process-based groups that are co-facilitated, as I've named. Um, they all, in some capacity or another, uh, approach shame. Um, all of them have an inclusive approach to spirituality uh, and religion, um, include some kind of measurement. This is something that some teams were eager to do. For others, it was something we uh, you know, encouraged a little bit, but all of them do include measurement as part of what they do. Um, some of you are familiar with um, Judith Herman and, and her pioneering work um, in, in the area of trauma and trauma recovery. Uh, so all of these groups... Um, in some capacity do attend to sort of all three phases uh, of um, Herman's um, trauma recovery model. So that's safety, uh, remembrance and mourning, and, and reconnection. So those elements exist um, in all of the groups. Psychological flexibility, that's kind of a jargony term uh, that is used uh, within the acceptance and commitment therapy um, work especially. Uh, but all groups do focus on fostering that. And, and what's meant by that um, is really uh, helping folks to uh, be more flexible um, in response to the morally injurious events. So we're, we're not trying to tell people something different happened than what happened. 
but are there different ways for you to be able to respond to that, to more flexibly respond um, to what happened than in ways that um, have not been um, life-giving, uh, ways that have not, you know, that have uh, perhaps been functionally impairing uh, or whatever language we wanna use. Um, all the groups uh, explore forgiveness um, in some capacity, as well as attributions of blame. Uh, they incorporate ritual in some way, which is very different than if we were looking at just some kind of uh, psychotherapeutic process. Um, and then all of them have, uh, you know, a very person-centered orientation uh, that includes, yes, both insight as well as, you know, action, sort of a, the psychologist in me wants to think in terms of sort of behaviorist um, things. So how does your life actually look different? How are you doing things? differently uh, as a result of going through this group. Uh, so there are a number of different emerging uh, psychological interventions, uh, books that have been put out there so far. Um, so Joe Currier and Kent Thresher and I have edited a book on addressing moral injury in clinical practice that features a number of different chapters uh, from um, folks who are doing different kinds of um, interventions uh, for moral injury. Um, there's, uh, you know, some of them that have their own workbooks. So adaptive disclosure has its own workbook that's out there. The moral injury workbook, that one's out there. It's acceptance and commitment therapy based. Um, there is a book that, uh, Nancy Ramsey and Carrie Doring co-edited on military moral injury and spiritual care. So a number of different resources for folks uh, who might be in a position of providing care, uh, to individuals with, with moral injury. Uh, and also some interesting uh, emerging work uh, from other sectors. So um, have recently been in contact with, with some colleagues at Advent Health uh, who've been pioneering a nursing-based intervention um, that's focusing on nurses and focusing on um, resilience um, and, and some of these kind of things. And they've been starting to use this um, in the midst of the uh, pandemic. Um, and one of the things that this intervention uh, makes uh, a lot of use of uh, is something that I just alluded to, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. Uh, and so ACT is something that I do a lot of work with. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go into great detail uh, about it now. That's for, you know, another time or place. Um, the general um, approach within acceptance and commitment therapy, that, though, I, I have there at the top of the, the slide, and that is approaching difficulties and challenges, approaching maybe even suffering that you've experienced in your, your life with this mindset of hold and move. So the I, idea is kind of holding your experience, um, whether that's thoughts, feelings, sensations, emotions, and moving forward in your life. Uh, so moving is kind of paying attention very intentionally to what are your values? What do you want your life to be about? And how can you uh, move in that direction? And so I think there are a number of ways that, that act. Now, I'm not trying to say this is the only uh, way to approach moral injury, uh, but I, I think there are a number of ways that act does um, offer some distinctive ways for approaching moral injury with respect to, you know, holding that experience, not trying to change it, not trying to say that it's something that it wasn't, but maybe that experience tells you something about your values even. Maybe, maybe that thing that happened, you'd say, I was moving in the opposite direction of my values when that happened. What, what I want my life to be about really goes, you know, goes this way. Um, but how can I be, you know, present to that? How can I acknowledge that it happened, but, but not allow that thing to inhibit me from moving forward in valued directions in my life, from being, you know, potentially a moral person uh, in my life and, and moving forward. Um, so what I'd like to do, and I, I know I've just sort of have lightly touched on act and that you know approach and we just don't have uh time to, to unpack all of that here but i would like to offer before um we close today i'd like to offer 
one more kind of experiential um, exercise for us. So this will take maybe 10 to 15 minutes. So we'll, I think we'll have a little bit of time to, to wrap up at the end. Um, but what I'd like to invite folks to do as uh, part of this exercise um, is to identify a place um, in your experience or in your life um, where you've, you know, perhaps suffered or known a real difficulty or a pain or a challenge in your life. Um, and when I go through this exercise and invite you to do that, um, I want to acknowledge that folks are in different places today. Some of you may be going straight from this into, you know, your work context or a clinical context. Uh, so as I go through this exercise, I, I want to invite you to, you know, select something that's meaningful to you, um, but you don't need to select, you know, the deepest, darkest thing that, that's ever happened to you, uh, unless you're in a, a place to kind of think about that today. So I, I want to, you know, encourage you as, as we go through this exercise, um, you know, to be sort of mindful of, um, you know, what feels sort of psychologically safe for you. Uh, as as we go through this and what you feel like uh, you can handle, but you know when I when I've done this before with groups, uh, folks have have found it beneficial. So do want to take a moment here to give us um, that experience today. Um, so if you can, uh, again, would sort of invite you, similar to uh, as we did when we started our time together today. Uh, if you have other distractions or your phone's on or your email's pinging or whatever, um, if you're able to kind of just silence those distractions uh, for the moment or for the next 10 minutes or so uh, to engage in this exercise, go ahead and just kind of place your feet on the ground. You can place your hands in your lap, just get into a comfortable position. And to kind of bring your attention to this exercise, just invite you to take a deep breath in. Just notice the cool air as you breathe in. And then how as you breathe out, the air is warmer. If that helps, invite you to close your eyes. So throughout uh, some of this presentation today, I've been touching on this um, topic of moral injury and, and may have talked about some things that have resonated um, with you on different levels, maybe for those that you've cared for, but maybe also uh, on an individual level, on a personal level, maybe this has brought up some things for you, maybe past personal challenges or experiences uh, that you've had. And as you think about that, I invite you to just kind of bring to mind um, some place in your life where you've known a challenge or a difficulty or pain. Maybe a place in your life where you would say that you've known suffering. Bring that to mind. And once you've identified that thing, uh, if you can, I invite you to just kind of take your hands, you know, if you've got your hands in your lap, you can just kind of cup them and put them in front of you, you know, on the desk or in your lap, wherever you're sitting. And imagine that you could just hold that thing, that, that challenge or difficulty or suffering that you've known in your life to actually just hold it in your hands. See if you can do that, and, and as you do that, see if you can notice this thing, know what it looks like, or if there's a shape or a substance or a color to it. 
notice, you know, if you move your hands up and down a little bit, notice if it like, has a weight to it. Notice what it feels like to, to try to just hold this thing, the suffering that you've known uh, in front of you in your hands. And as you do that, I want to invite you to kind of reflect back, you know, if you kind of look at this thing, to reflect back on your life and, and just notice, you know, the times or the places where maybe this thing is, has popped up or notice the, the ways in which it has had consequences for you in your life. Maybe for some of you, this is something that, that you're holding that goes back some distance. Maybe for some of you, this is a more recent experience. Just kind of notice how long you've been carrying this thing. And notice, you know, as you hold it and look at it, notice, you know, is this something that you feel like you're carrying in your life, maybe even now? And as you do that and, and reflect on that, if you could just still imagine holding that in front of you, I want to I want to invite you, if you can imagine this. That, that you could just take that thing and sort of, you know, remove it from your existence, remove it from your life, or, you know, if you could take it and you could just toss this thing off of a cliff or, you know, into the depths of the sea, just to be rid of it. Imagine if you could take this suffering that you've known and just expunge it from, from your life. And, and from your history. If you're able to do that, I, I invite you to kind of notice what comes up for you. Any feelings that, that might come up, maybe it's a feeling of, you know, lightness or liberty or relief. Maybe it's a different feeling. Maybe other things are coming up for you as you think about doing that. Now what I'd like to invite you to do is, is to bring to mind a, a loved one. You know, maybe it's um, maybe it's a son or a daughter or a niece or a nephew, but you know, preferably somebody who's maybe a little bit um, maybe a little bit younger than you. Maybe they're an adolescent or a young young adult. See if you can take a moment to just you know kind of bring this person. To mind and to sort of hold them there in your your mind's eye with a sense of uh, a sense of love and kindness. And as you're imagining this person and, and sort of holding them with this sense of affection, I want you to imagine that this this individual, this person that you you know, really care about that they that they come to you and they say, "Hey, I, you know, I really want to talk with you about something. Uh, I, I want to talk with you about something that's really been bothering me, and, and you know, something that I haven't really talked with anybody else, you know, about this before." Uh, and, they, and they come to you and they ask that, and you know, of, of course, this is somebody you love and you care about. And you say, yeah, you know, of course, you, you can talk to me. And you know, you invite them to sit down, and and they start telling you, you know, about this thing that that they're dealing with. And and as you listen to this thing, as you hear them describe it. This thing that they're describing begins to sound an awful lot like 
your experience. You know, maybe it's not the exact same, but but it, there are parts of it that kind of sound pretty similar to you. To that thing that I invited you, you know just a moment ago to kind of get rid of that that suffering or that pain that you've known in your life before. And what I'd like to present you with in, in this moment, you know, as you're hearing them describe this, I want to give you a choice. I want to give you two options. The first option is that you can hear this, this thing from this person that, that you care about. You can hear this from a perspective of having lived a life fully untouched by that suffering that you've known. And, and you can relate to this, you know, loved one from maybe a perspective of, of sympathy, but not really true understanding, not really true empathy, not as somebody who's been there before. Your first choice is, okay, yeah, you know, I never experienced that thing. And I can sit here and you know, hear this person. And your second choice is, you know, at least in this moment, to choose to hold on to your experience. You know, to choose to hold on to that, that pain or suffering that you've known and to be able to relate to this person that you care for from that perspective. As I, as I give you that choice, what option would you select? If you've selected the option of kind of holding your experience, notice what it's like to be present with this other individual, this person that you care for. Notice whether choosing to hold your, your own experience alienates you from this loved one or brings you closer to this person. When you're ready, I invite you to kind of you know, set this image down. Um, to go ahead and kind of take a deep breath in. And now you can notice kind of the feeling of your body and your chair and your, your feet on the ground. If you've closed your eyes, I invite you to kind of open your eyes and, and you bring your attention back um, to this webinar and to this uh, space. Um, if you were able to do that, I want to say thank you um, for being willing to go through that exercise. Uh, one of the things that I hope that you may take or some of you may take from that exercise um, is the importance of, of sharing our experiences and, and, and having shared compassion uh, for one another, sometimes even growing out of places where we've known difficulty or where we've known pain or where we've, we've known suffering. Um, I want to conclude with a final thought, and then I'll just um, put up two resource slides uh, for folks. Um, so I've mentioned Jonathan Shea's name uh, a number of times today, and uh, at one point in his book, Achilles in Vietnam, he writes, I cannot escape the suspicion that what we do as mental health professionals is not as good as the healing that in other cultures has been rooted in the native soil of the returning soldiers community. We must create our own new models of healing, which emphasize the communalization of the trauma. Combat veterans and American citizenry should meet together face to face in daylight and listen and watch and weep. Tragedy brings us to cherish our mortality, to savor and embrace it. Tragedy inclines us to prefer attachment to fragile mortals whom we love. 
And I think a lot of that language could be substituted uh, for what many within healthcare have experienced here uh, in the past couple years. There's been plenty uh, of tragedy, and, and I and I hope that uh, for those of you who you know this has been at all relevant today or, or has stirred anything up, I hope that uh, you do take an opportunity to to reach out, you know, as appropriate to seek help. I, I do. I want to you know just note this one resource that is on our website. We have a series that was developed initially for faith communities, can be used uh, among other groups. It's a four-part series, video series. Um, the videos are intended to inspire discussion around the topic of, you know, how can our community be a place that inspires belonging uh, for persons with, you know, mental health struggles uh, or for veterans. Uh, moral injury is one of the topics that, that we look at in there. Uh, so if you're somebody who's in a community or a faith community, and you think this could be uh, useful, uh, want to make you aware of that. And then on an individual level, uh, again, if this has brought something up for you, uh, you know, encourage you, if you feel like you as a care provider could benefit from care, you know, reach out, get that care. If you feel like you could benefit from therapy, um, sometimes, unfortunately, it's us care providers who have the most stigma around seeking care ourselves. You know, if you're a chaplain on here and everybody's turning to you, maybe you need to seek care yourself. Or if you're a mental health professional or a social worker or a nurse, maybe it's time for you to seek care yourself. And I encourage you to do that. Um, that might be professional help. I know as part of the pandemic, many folks have been much more isolated uh, than they would have been otherwise. You know, if there's ways for you to reach out to re-engage with or to newly engage with social support systems, I encourage you to do that. And then I know at Memorial Hermann that you guys have recently staffed, staffed up your wellness team there uh, for folks who are on campus at Memorial Hermann. You know, I know that chaplaincy is a resource uh, for folks there. Uh, so for, for any of you, if this has brought things up today, I uh, really encourage you uh, to reach out and, and to seek that care. Uh, and with that, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, I want to say thank you. And if folks want to reach out to me with any questions or comments, I uh, invite you uh, to do that. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Newsom. Um, wow, what, a, what an important conversation today. So many more questions in the chat and Q&A feature that we did not get to. Um, and I guess what I would say regarding those is I hope those questions uh, will continue to stir within you and that you'll seek answers both for yourself and those uh, for whom you care. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them today. This is such a rich topic in light of all of our personal and professional experiences these days. But thank you all for participating.